pedagogy has come up quite a bit in this discussion, but in, in sort of a, this kind of way. It comes up, it pokes its nose up, and then it resubmerges like the Loch Ness Monster. Um, so I'm glad we have a panel uh, where we can actually talk a bit about it and about the consequences of all this, partly because this whole event arose in a conversation that Fotis and I had a few years ago about how hard it would be to teach data modeling in a humanities context because of the lack of discourse, the lack of existing published materials, the lack of, of source material. And so the pedagogical motive is very strong in, in, this, in this event. So um, anyway, um, there were three or four questions which we had sort of posed to you um, to start things off. And they are, um, and I'm sorry, I guess I don't have them up there. Um, but first of all, what's distinctive about humanities data modeling as opposed to, or as distinct from the modeling of data in other fields from a specifically pedagogical perspective? So what's distinctive about teaching data modeling in a humanities context? How do, have you found it coming up perhaps in your own teaching? Um, and the second question is, what value does data modeling hold for the digital humanities classroom? or in other quasi-pedagogical contexts, for example, ongoing professional development. Um, as traditional humanists retrain as digital humanists, what value does data modeling hold in that sort of professional transformation that the field may be undergoing? Um, the third question was, what kinds of conceptual challenges do humanists face in understanding data modeling as part of their work, or in understanding it at all, maybe is another question. And finally, um, consider strategies for teaching data modeling, again, broadly speaking, to humanists. What kinds of explanatory models have you seen working particularly well or particularly poorly? So I'm, I'm putting those questions out to kind of uh, paradigmatically to start things off. Um, but maybe um, then I can just repeat the first question as a, as a starting point. What's distinctive about humanities data modeling as distinct from the modeling in, that might happen in other fields from a pedagogical perspective, or what's distinctive about teaching data modeling in a humanities context, that kind of thing. I wonder if you could, and if that's a terrible starting point, feel free to pick one of the other questions to start with. <laughs> you, you can have an insurrection and say, we hate that question. question it's because bird. I have no idea. That's the answer. Uh, I just teach modeling in the humanities, so I have no idea what people in mathematics teach. Or, or in other fields. I know what it is teaching to, not only in the humanities, but to my specific community, which is even different, okay? So I, I do think it's much helpful, to, more helpful for myself, not to answer to this question, because I don't have an answer, but go to other, <laughs> the other point if you. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. Absolutely. Let's take that question off the table until we're ready for it. I don't know, uh, okay, okay, as I started. Um, the second question otherwise is, what does the data model hold for the digital humanities classroom is very relevant for me. It's the, the main, uh, is what, uh, okay, what I teach. I teach XML, XSLT, TI, all these kind of things, as well as other things, but this is the most important bit of my teaching. I teach undergraduate, postgraduate, PhD students. So what I teach to these people that are not very happy to be too technical things, I have to say, they normally resist a lot. When I do start on the modeling side of things, otherwise, they feel back as they are humanist again. So they don't have to learn angle brackets. They kind of take a breath and they understand. Is that actually the moment in which all the teaching I've been doing, all the, 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 the convey of the technical bits make sense because they start to understand how to, to use that to use what they know as humanities people and their own knowledge in, to put it into, into angle brackets. And it's the moment in which the click happens and they're then much, more, much happier after. Um, what is the challenge that they face? I do think the most important challenge is the fact they are not used to look at the data in the way we need them to look at them the moment that they start modeling. So they have to look at exactly the same data they've always been looking, their texts, basically. Uh, but in a different perspective, looking at different features. So that's the, the part that is very hard for them, and we need to reiterate, reiterate the same uh, uh, action. So you go into the document and say, okay, this is a feature. And say, oh, right. I, I've never thought about <coughs> that. Yes, I know it's a title, I know it's a name, but does it mean this, what does it mean that? And they say, it is a name, and it's something you may choose or not to encode. 
wow. And that is the part that is challenging for them. So looking at the material they are familiar with, but with a different eye. And the strategies that works are two different strategies normally I use. The first is what I call the top-down approach, meaning what you want to achieve. Visualize your website, the final website, what you want to do. And think backward what you need to, to do to process to achieve that result. Because it's easier for them to, to understand, look, thinking of the final product than thinking of the document they have and model it from there. So that's what I call the top-down approach. The, other, the second one is what I call the theoretical reach approach, which is uh, making them reflect on the, the modeling that they already know. For instance, uh, um, uh, the, the theory of communication, Jacobson, Saussure, those are models of language, of communication that they are, most of them are familiar with because they studied at the undergraduate level. So okay, this is a model. Think on this term. So using the, the models they already uh, are familiar with to, to apply to, to the documents and start to make them understand that what they actually do, they're applying those models somehow. And that helps because again, <laughs> they are back on their familiar knowledge and they can make the step forward to something that is more unfamiliar. Therefore, the, that's the, the second approach. The third the trick, that I call, it, that I call the trick, <laughs> it's not a method, it's a trick, is to use material they are familiar with. So if I'm talking to medievists, use medieval manuscripts. If I'm talking to epigraphists, use stones. If I use to Italians to colors, Italian material, and so far so on. Something that they, I know they are expert on. So I can show them what they can do with their own material. That is my trick. Sorry? Can you repeat the name of your first two methods of work trick? Okay, the first is called the top down. <laughs> I mean, the end, from the end, so the final um, results. We use normally uh, wireframing. So we do the wireframe, the final website, or mock up the website and work backwards. And the second one I said is the theoretically rich. Theoretically rich. Rich, rich. exactly. So I got on all the theories that I've been hearing structuralist, post-structuralist, and try to make the think that they can actually think them in, into an XML. And that is the second model, that's the, just to answer the fourth question. So perhaps I, I take over. Um, my background is uh, a bit further away from digital humanities in the end. I mean, I'm t I teach um, <coughs> Romans linguistics, now, uh, okay, linguistics in a very broad sense, that means also perhaps the history of the science and um, social linguistics and all these sort of uh, things. Um, but in my courses, I always uh, do not just want to teach my students something about linguistics, but also something about research methods and something about how you do research, actually, and above all, um, scientific, um, sound scientific approaches. That means, for example, also academic paper writing. Now, my students in Roman, stu in Roman studies, uh, as Elena uh, already said, I mean, all these things uh, which we are doing nowadays, markup, uh, ontologies, uh, data, and all these sort of concepts in a way, they have been always implicit uh, nobody ever talked about data, even if a text was always there. Everybody used text or filing cabinets with um, what these uh, uh, small cards, carte cards, I call it, yeah? in 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 boxes. Yeah, you ordered them, you created some sort of ontology in the end, and you set up relations between them. But nobody ever looked at uh, them like this. And so, doing research was also always much more, and also writing a scholarly paper. Was, always, is, was always looked upon as much more sort of a creative, mental, I don't know what sort of process. Yeah? And this is still the case in most, uh, in Roman studies in the end, because even with the computer, there was no uh, way of working or no approach uh, which would uh, teach students uh, also a sensible, um, uh, to in exploit sensibly the, the technology to do all the work. So this is not in place. So my students normally, um, 
they arrive at the class, they, okay, they write an academic paper, but they're not even conscious that the layout is a structure, what is a text, that a, a text is a structured entity, that there's a systematic layout, that things mean things. Yeah. Um, and they've got no idea about data, and it's very difficult for them even to set links between the sources they use inside a text and the bibliography. All these sort of concepts uh, are not really uh, explicit, implicitly, but uh, it's not very consistent. So anyway, the approach I've been taking uh, lately was to set up a project uh, where the research question was about what is the influence of the neogrammarians on Romance linguistics? And um, during this um, project, uh, I asked, we, students had to mark up uh, texts because the texts needed to be included in this portal we created. So by um, marking up text and using o o uh, oxygen, for example, they learn a lot about text. Yeah? They, first of all, uh, notice that even their own texts, which they've never realized before, are, they are always marked up. And so they understand what markup is actually about and that there is a structure. And if you define these elements, you can also change them. They also learn uh, that uh, rendering is uh, a different level from, from the data itself. And another sort of thing which works really well or worked very well in, during this project was actually EndNote, because EndNote, the database it offers, uh, the students had to insert uh, the data they collected for their project, and they had to learn that uh, you have to respect the fields, uh, that different publications have different uh, information bits they need. Um, they also learned um, that style sheets can be applied to consistently entered data, and that you can even change the rendering and the data remain the same. And integrating all this together is what actually I would uh, hope for, a uh, conceptual change. Um, also that students do not look at computers any longer as a typewriter. <laughs> and that's what they actually do, but uh, also as a, at a document, uh, uh, an academic paper, as a, at a, as a, at a as <laughs> as a document uh, which is structured, which I can change, that it, the whole thing is a process anyway of write, writing such a paper nowadays, nowadays um, because by applying a different output, I can uh, change the whole structure of a paper, all these sort of things. So I think altogether it should change their whole uh, understanding of what they are actually doing, and that's the most important thing. Um, I could add to that. Um, I don't teach data modeling per se, I teach literature. Um, and yet, I think that there are certain things in terms of data structures that are extremely useful for teaching literature. Um, and one of them is uh, teaching them formalism, the elements of works and how, um, how things hang together. And one thing I like to do, just to show students um, how it is that the texts that they read online are marked up, are tagged, are coming to them, you know, very highly mediated, um, is show them this very wonderful, simple example from the TEI standards of Blake's Rose Thou Art Sick, right? I say, oh, you see this, and you're familiar with it, and you've had it in your high school you know, uh, literature classes, and here you see it online, and perhaps what, you know, you don't realize is that there's um, all sorts of data attached to this poem so that you can enjoy it and see it and read it, but at the same time, if you look at these lines, you have a way to parse this poem. We realize simply by looking at the structure of this poem that it's comprised of lines and stanzas, and this is actually a very useful tool for students who I can sympathize who might not be interested in or, or resistant. They might be resistant to learning technical skills. I assure you, they're also resistant to literary analysis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> and so this actually, in some ways, provides them. Ah, oh, I, I, I can do this. You know, I, I see this. You know, this, this whole idea of a formal analysis is not perhaps as abstract as it seems. Here is actually a way that it's done in a very simple framework. So, so that's something I find extremely useful um, in terms of teaching literature. And I'm also always on the lookout. 
um, for the wonderful types of uh, visualizations that uh, we saw yesterday with Wendell's presentation, that we saw um, earlier today with um, Vannevar Bush, um, et cetera. And so I think these are things that um, I use in my pedagogy, um, and I think I'd like to see to see more of in, in my own teaching. <laughs> So I've gone from a position of, of not teaching for a long time, maybe the odd to doing almost a scene as well. I don't say nothing but teaching, <laughs> but, but teaching a lot. I started a master's, there's a PhD at Trinity, and I teach undergraduate. Um, and I'm realizing for certainly the master's and PhD, the methods that I've used I think don't serve me or my students. I hope they're not listening. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, because I used to teach one course and how much you can get through in one course is very different from teaching a whole master's, even though in Ireland our years are, 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 our master's is just one year. So I'm very grateful actually to, to Fotis and Julia for having this symposium now, because I had started to rethink how I might teach. And this gave me an opportunity to think quite differently. And what happens if I uh, frame particularly um, some of the more introductory courses in terms of modeling? I'm not sure I'm gonna call it that. Um, because I think that might scare some people away in any way. It's a big deal to change a course name. But it seems to me that there's, there's maybe four different not mutually exclusive approaches. One is teaching modeling through theory, something very theoretical, or something very practical. That you're teaching them modeling, but, but not from a theoretical point of view by doing it. Or by um, uh, having them model something. Um, and as I said, you know, not not um, not telling them what they're doing. And so it seems to me that um, we, when we were talking this yesterday, or was it this morning about teaching research methods as well, not not only to our students in digital humanities, but all the other students who do research methods. How important it is, and I hadn't thought of that before, to teach them the kind of skills that's going to help them manage and model the. Information. Sorry, so they are com complaining <laughs> online that oh, they're they not that they here. Yeah. Hear <laughs> Sorry. Um, that that that. In fact, I think we're going to be doing a disservice to our professions if we don't teach the next generation of students how to, in fact, model their own data. Because this is how we all collect data now. As someone said, you go into libraries, take photographs. We have a lot of Word documents. You know, you try to find them on your hard drive. You put them on uh, Dropbox. Um, and then you know, do searches to see if you can find them. Um, so it seems to me, even in training, which I've done a, a lot of uh, around <coughs> some schools, data modeling always seems to be implicit. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've ever seen, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong, in a digital humanities summer school, certainly not one that I've done, maybe unfortunately, um, there is no data modeling course. We teach it implicitly, so we teach XML, and there's data modeling, or we teach XSLT, or we teach something else, and it's implicit, but nobody signs into it. So it seems to me that we're missing a, a whole level. Um, and, and it was a question that maybe we started, you know, what's different? And, and uh, as well, I have not taught in computer science departments, but, but I suspect one of the differences is that we don't have data modeling as a kind of primary method that we teach apart from the technologies themselves. Um, and so it seems to me it's, it's that thing, you know, if, if you um, teach someone how to fish, you know, they, they can eat for a long time. Um, if, if we're teaching them XML or we're teaching them a particular technology, then they know how to do that. But it seems to me what we probably should be teaching them is a, is a level up so that when the new technology comes along, as it will in, in their lifetimes if they stay in this field, they can then apply that knowledge that we've taught them to the new technology as opposed to having to learn each one separately. So I had a recent experience, and, and it, it came up around the time I've, I've been thinking about this for, for this um, um, uh, workshop. And I asked my students, uh, as part of the kind of um, digital scholar in the editing course, to evaluate other thematic research collections. And they did, and, and they wrote about it in, in the old style. Um, and they did very well. And then I asked them for their own projects to do wireframes of theirs. And they, they didn't do so well. <laughs> um, um, and it seemed to me they didn't make that leap between what they understood when they evaluated in text the other um, 
uh, thematic research collections, and what I was asking them to do was to create an abstract model of the site they were going to create. So then I thought, well, maybe, maybe there's a different approach. Of course, there's always a different approach. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, what happens if I ask them to model a thematic <coughs> research collection as an exercise? And I ask one group to model it in XML, and I ask another group to use PowerPoint and do it that way, because it's the model that's important, not the, the language that they're using to model. And that would also teach the kinds of things that you were also talking about, that, that it's not the language that we use to express it, but, but the underlying, the, the concepts either under or, or overlying it. Um, so it seems to me, the other, the last point I made, also in preparation for this, I looked up, because I remembered that when UVA was thinking of doing a master's in digital humanities, um, they put a lot of information online. And, it, and I remembered, in fact, I went back to look, that two of the core modules are knowledge representation. Um, and I remember that this came about, this um, course that didn't come about, actually, um, but a lot of work is online about it, uh, a, a, after a series of, of kind of discussions and workshops that they had at UVA to, to try to figure out what does a, 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 a what could a digital humanities masters look like. And I was struck again by the centrality of the knowledge representation courses in this. This is fascinating. I mean, what I'm hearing from these different examples is a number of different approaches um, that come from different uh, disciplinary perspectives. And I wonder whether um, you guys, and also then obviously this is open, um, could speak to the question of if we are to teach data modeling, if we're responding to the to the urge to make it an explicit part of our pedagogy, is that something that can be done outside of a disciplinary context or in a trends or interdisciplinary context? Could you teach a course on data modeling for, say, humanities graduate students, or would it need to be, you know, for classicists, for literary students for linguists, right? Is there a way we could imagine data modeling as a topic in itself in a humanities context? Well, what, what I do teach is uh, to digital humanities students that have all sorts of background. Okay. So they don't have one type of background. And I do use so different examples. So I think you can do that. It is, uh, there is things that are very specific. Uh, actually, I do teach text, so they need to be text grounded. But text is something that is common on most humanities background. So that I just make sure that they take some documents and material we look at, which is of wide interest. The last we used was the Gettysburg address, which was, uh, there is a lot of digital images, the different versions, so it was a very good example. And something can be interested for, for many, many backgrounds, to be honest. So that was the reason I, I chose something that is iconic, that's what I mean. It's not working very well, this one. Okay. Well, I'm this one. Okay. Very heavy things. Thanks. This one works. I thought that I would be saying exactly the contrary. Because, I mean, I agree with what she said before concerning the importance of working on sources which are very close to the domain of expertise of the students, that background domain. And I think it is a matter of giving confidence, or giving technical confidence to the students. It means to make them be in the position to say, look, I know my stuff. As a linguist, I've got some concepts I've acquired on my, my previous year of training. As an historian, I've got some concepts. I take a document, and this guy is asking me to put this together as an XML document. I've just heard what XML was five minutes ago, and I discover I can't do that because I understand the material. So I think it is very essential. So if you've got a heterogeneous classes, a heterogeneous class, you need to know how to organize that in subgroups where they can have this um, um, epiphany moment, you know, where they say, aha, yeah, I, I can build up my concept as something more technical than I thought. So it, it's a very important issue. There. Is there anything besides the knowledge they already have on general concepts where you think, uh, beyond the level of XML or this kind of module, we say, this is so basic to, to data modeling, they have to know about it uh, without any relevance whether what kind of study they're doing. Uh, 
like indirection, abstraction, things like that could be, could be something. That's what I use the, the theory theory rich approach in a yeah. sense because I build on, on theory that they already know and the point is to make them uh, they uh, shift from the empirical of looking at specific to the abstraction and to make the model <laughs> became abstract. They do already in many many circumstances because they, they if you look at the theory of communication, the theory of uh, literature, language, they, which they are familiar, they are able to understand the signifier and the significant, for instance, what it is. But that's that's a moment in which the abstraction already happens. So that that's how I use it, and for these reasons. So I'm just about the furthest thing from someone who's an expert in pedagogy, just to... But a, 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 the thought occurs to me if I want to teach about modeling, I, I, I wonder if we don't divorce ourselves a little bit from the idea that this is data modeling, or the idea that this is knowledge representation, and rather think to ourselves, what we want to teach first is just information management. <coughs> And couch that way, I, 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 maybe I'm wrong, but to me it doesn't sound as scary. Um, and then rather than taking, and I'm kind of, I'm answering Julia's question, can we do this you know, for a broad spectrum of people rather than directly aimed at certain disciplines? Well, all of us have experience in certain things that we could take advantage of. Um, one that jumps to mind is saying, is using things, your first example of an information model is what information do you want to collect to keep track of your own personal collection of photographs? or something like that, that everyone can get their teeth into. You know, you know, you want to who took the picture, what camera you used, what day, who's in the picture, stuff like that. Model that first, and then step into texts in, in disciplines that the students have some access to. Is that a reasonable thought, or am I going crazy? It's not for me, not in my experience. <laughs> The students, especially, you know, the higher you go, uh, um, postgraduate or PhD students, they, they regard this as patronizing. They say, you know what, I know these things. I'm a PhD student, treat me as an adult. So they want really to get directly on something that is relevant for what they do. It doesn't work if you don't give them a challenge or some material that is likely to be part of their experience. That is my experience, though, by maybe It's weird, they don't react that much, do they? <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry, <laughs> I'm very naughty. But it's, it's difficult for, for the undergraduate students because they normally listen to you and not a lot, whatever you do. Sorry, Susan. Oh, yeah. I, was, I was going to maybe answer to uh, respond to Fotis. I was, again, um, rereading things about modeling and I was looking at um, uh, Willard's uh, article in the Companion to Digital Humanities again, and he broke down modeling into these five areas, analog analogy, representation, diagram, map, simulation, and experiment. Um, and again, it's a kind of step up. I wonder if some, uh, a model, as it were, like that could serve as, as, a, 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 as a way to uh, teach modeling, but, but not specifically about a particular language or tool or um, and abstract out and, and demonstrate how these become models um, and, and how we use them, and both, both theoretically and very practically. presume they get it, or they get something, right. but it not, might not be something they can abstract 
to the next tool that comes along. So the tool becomes the vehicle, not the purpose. what you're teaching them is you can express this in XML or you can express in uh, a relational database and here's what doesn't work maybe but have them figure it out so you know could a, a way of teaching this be to, to set a problem as, as I said before maybe and have you know if you have groups working have them work in the different technologies or, or have them model the same thing in different technologies but some way of allowing them to get to that space that, that you're trying to um, give them with other examples. I don't know if this will work either, but, but it's exactly what you're talking about, which I imagine was the original question. Do they do this differently in engineering or computer science and mathematics so that once you learn one language, it, it's easy to pick up, easier to, fairly easy to pick up another, because it's the concepts that are important, well, it's also not the expression. Well, institutional strategy. I mean, I know mm. at many American universities, mm. the question is, if we're going to teach topics like this, where do they get taught? Do they need to be taught in the departments? Do they need to be taught across departments? Um, do you benefit from having archaeologists and <coughs> linguists and romance languages people all in the same classroom learning data models, or do you benefit from having you know each group being taught separately? And I think you know, interesting way this maps onto the phrase uh, "getting your hands dirty" that that came into the discussion yesterday, and and really makes us ask. Do we think of modeling as the new version of the liberal education? Like it's like the classics in 19th century British education <coughs> system, where once you know that, you know everything, and you can go everywhere. Or is it more like chemistry um, or engineering, where once you know it, you can do a bunch of stuff? Um, and, and that, I think, bears on the question of whether what happens when a scholar understands modeling is that they're getting their hands dirty, or on the contrary, that they're keeping them very clean. Um, can I, uh, I like this idea of the fact that uh, Stephen was uh, suggesting or presenting older programming language. Uh, what I tend to do for that precise purposes is to say, okay, I'm not teaching everything. Uh, I'm teaching XML, TI, XSLT, and CSS in 20 hours. I mean, it's kind of a big challenge, and Trevor can say that because he was in my classes. <laughs> um, you, I always say that I can teach you like 40% of, uh, and, and relax and G as well, sorry. Uh, I, I teach you 40% of that, 30% of that, 40%, 20%, 5%. The rest is yours, because I want you to teach, to learn how to learn, not the technology itself. So the fact that in a course I teach so many technology at once, in a sense, and all of them are to be used together, makes some sense. And the fact that they have to go and learn by themselves a lot because 
Otherwise, say, you know, in five years, then technology will be obsolete. So what you are up, we, we're not preparing you for five years work, but we want to prepare you to become a digital humanities person that goes there and learn a new technology in five years time. So you have to learn how to learn, and that's what he's assessed as well. I was just going to respond to what Sorry. you um, just asked, Julie, because I, like Elena, teach whoever signs into the digital humanities course. But um, I, I think there's an advantage to having different disciplines there, because we, the advantage to just having your own discipline, it does make it easier. Um, but the, advan the other advantage is that you get people who understand or will represent the same objects very differently because they come from different theoretical and disciplinary backgrounds. And allowing students to, to see how others do that representation or the knowledge they take out of it, I, I think is um, stronger than possibly the, the benefit of having all the same types of people in the room. There's more people, but yeah. after that I would like to say. Okay, doesn't matter. Um, I just um, wanted to progress that a little bit and say, ask the question, is there anything abstract Or is it really just um, about XML or about relational database? I don't think there is anything much abstract. I think it's almost all tied to reality. I think the, the analogy with programming languages is not a perfect one. You've got many different similar programming languages that are all imperative or they're all functional or whatever. One can, to some extent, swap between them. But the, the database model, the relational database model, and XML are not exactly similar. I think what, you, what you've been describing is just teaching XML there. Um, it kind of relates to that. Um, still trying to, to, to get it to the level where there, there are any abstractions worthwhile in weighing without the same level of teaching XML. Um, one of them is um, I found that um, every model is a model under a certain perspective. So um, if you want to make this point very clear from the very beginning, they don't think they model some ontology or some things really out there, but it's a model under a certain perspective. And usually as a researcher, talking to young researchers, you try to say, okay, you will have a research question and then you model the, the, the stuff on yourself. But um, they don't have any research questions and basically I'm very happy to ask around, um, do you have an answer how to do this, how to make them think up Research questions. If they just, I mean, I'm teaching this to uh, 12 one course to undergraduates, and they are very, at the very beginning of their researcher life, if, if at all. So they, everything is new for them, and they don't have any idea of what a research question could be in, in, in the three studies or whatever. And um, so they don't have a need for models, and so they are basically not interested in data modeling at all. And, and um, I would be glad to find a way around that speak a little to that in terms of literary studies because I would never, in, in my department, I don't think we would ever have a class per se on data modeling. Mm -hmm. uh, yet, I think it's absolutely crucial for um, literary studies courses to incorporate digital humanities tools. And that's what I think um, I'd like to see, you know, perhaps a gap narrowed there. Um, and so um, for my classes, I think what Sid brought up, you know, um, many undergraduates who are majors in English in, in, in my college, or in different colleges where I've taught, um, uh, would be very, would not feel patronized if they were asked, you know, what, what would you use to gather your, your photographs? What would you use to gather your documents? What online tool would you, you know, would you be comfortable with using? And that would be a wonderful way in to get them to think about how it is to, you know, translate that to the analysis of literary texts. Um, one tool that I have been using more frequently is the Electronic Literature Organization's directory, which is something I've been a, a member of uh, for a few years now where it's, it's not, um, it, it, it's a wonderful resource in terms of gathering scholarship and information about works of electronic literature, net art, digital art, et cetera, um, but it's also a great pedagogical tool for undergraduate literature students. It gives them the opportunity to engage with these texts, write an entry, go through a peer review process, you know, but at the same time, they're responsible for tagging their own entries. They're responsible for thinking about how these texts that they're looking at um, are, are broken down and how they might translate that to other people. So it's something that I think is something of an overlap. Um, but um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, <coughs> I mean, I think we've got two different types of setup here. Yeah? I mean, you teaching digital humanities, and mm -hmm. we two are sort of trying to integrate more or less everything into our 
literature or linguistics classes. And so I, I agree with you, in, at, in my context, at the moment at least, I cannot see uh, separate classes for across the humanities, for example. Uh, if I want to do anything about digital humanities, then I have to do it in an integrated way. Now, I'm all for the integrated way anyway, also with um, academic paper writing, for example. There are all these courses and service centers and things like that, and I think they just cannot work. So the best thing is to bind it all up with a, with a topic of a seminar, and then they have got a research question, because in a, a traditional German seminar, you always have to write a paper on a certain topic, and then you have to collect uh, information like sources and bibliographical data, and you have to work on a structure and all these sort of things. Now, I break this all down into uh, individual elements, and then uh, in order to make people more conscious about this whole process and what they're actually doing, and consistencies and structures, and I mean, uh, an academic paper is anyway a very structured document. So, I mean, there's not much artifati going on in, in this um, context. Yes. You have to do it in a certain way. Yeah? But to make it conscious why it, is, why it has to be done in a certain way, because it has to be scientific and um, data have to be explicit and all these sort of things, I think that sort of uh, markup and uh, databases can actually help a lot uh, to, to make uh, students conscious about what they're actually doing and by the same time they learn something about digital humanity. So it's it's all in one in one pot. <laughs> it's gone in a... Yeah, so on the question
very traditional pedagogical roles of learning the methods and practices of research and you know the, the fourth uh, the literary formalism or, ling or linguistic categories. Those are in essence themselves data modeling. Always yep. have been long before the computer, and we refashion that in some ways when we bring digital technologies to it. At the same time, as there's also a continuum, right? So it's kind of like there there are two goals here, which you know, in some ways they're at odds, and then in other ways maybe they're potentially complementary. Where we see data modeling almost as an end in itself, something that that, that you know fits within the digital humanities, something that we do because we are building projects, or building uh, um, you know building resources. Um, yet, on the other hand, it's not really an end in itself. It's also a means to another end that's anchored within a discipline. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I just want to put that on the table because I think that's, you know, that's, if we don't keep in mind that there's that aspect to it, then we're just going to be very confused about what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. uh, what I was commenting on, on Fertis about how do you give research questions for students that are too young to have a research question? I don't think you can. What you can do is to ask them to model for a, for a public, for a specific target. They say, okay, build a website for this public. And that, once they start to do that, they can do because they have experience of the web. Then it can make them reflect that they, what they have done, they are actually answer to research question that, that this particular public will have. So it is a way around. It's very good. Librarianism, my title, but uh, I was actually going to talk of this, throw out an idea that I tried in a, a class before I got this job. Um, when I was teaching the, the history department at, at UVA as a grad student, I, I tried to create a class um, that would get students thinking about the ways in which we record information and how that changes over time. And so we, we went to the rare books. Uh, room and we looked at, at printed manuscripts, we set type and, and in, a, in a book school um, on a printing press and then I also took them up to nines and they looked at XSLT and uh, we geo-reference maps. But for the database section, which is my, you know, um, what I know best and what I do, um, in relational databases, I gave them some basic readings on, on what are databases, how are, they, how are they constructed, but then their assignment was to go and find one of the secondary source websites that they were, or primary source websites they were using to research their papers. Um, start putting in some search terms and write me up two paragraphs on how they thought um, the database was, query, was, was, was answering their queries. Um, could they tell 
if there was a clear relevancy to how the responses were, what, what responses they were getting back. Um, were they finding certain functionality built in, or did it seem like there were certain things missing from the underlying model? And we had a really, really great class when they came back because they demoed all these sites to the other students, so the students learned about all these other sources they could be looking at. But then we got into this great conversation about, well, they could find this subject term, but it couldn't find that subject term. Or, you know, I was looking around and I tried and finally found one that would really support some kind of Boolean argument that I was trying to create. And I think maybe it got them thinking about how the stuff that they interact with all the time has been modeled. And what they're getting back when they go and ask their research questions of these other materials is in fact being partially predetermined for them, and so how can they start to work that into their research? And we didn't do any programming. They didn't build any databases, but I told them a little, I got, taught them a little bit about databases, and then I let them loose on some databases um, to see what, to see what came back. I, Gina said it perfectly. I, I wanted to point out that I'll be the Andy Allen here and say that code studies is a kind of area which might well be brought into teaching data modeling because it's trying to look at sort of theorizing and making the ideologies that are going into something as simple as writing code. And some of the papers that we've heard even at DH have a lot to do with looking at how databases are constructed or how knowledge systems are constructed and how you know that is creative that, that that's pretty much people do it and, and kind of focus on that aspect of the knowledge representation. So yes. What she said. <laughs> I guess I'd like to just add to that very quickly to say that that's precisely the kind of thing that I would love to see gathered, consolidated, you know, best practices, uh, successful case studies, <laughs> that type of thing. And I've gone on record once now, and this is the second time I've gone. I, I think it's so vital. That so many of us who are teaching in the humanities who want to incorporate these types of techniques um, have a very kind of wonderfully rich but distributed. Uh, resource, <laughs> right? And so I, I'm, I'm very tempted uh, to put in uh, an application for any startup grant to have such a place, you know, for, mm -hmm. for teachers in the humanities, best case practices for using these things in our classrooms, what works, what doesn't, what's been disastrous, what's been a wonderful success, um, etc. And I think that would be something we would all benefit from. In this respect, there is a wonderful resource made by Mrs. Spiral about the syllabi uh, of the digital humanities around the world. It's a lot of about teaching digital humanities. It is in Zotero. And this, this research, this Zotero group about teaching digital humanities, I just wanted to point it out because it's really amazing. Do you want to follow up to what Ellie and Jean said? No, I'll speak louder. Okay, so follow up to what Ellie and Jean said. There is one interesting thing which we didn't talk about it's one and a half days, uh, which also is somehow not quite data modeling, but actually is, uh, which is ranking and, and, and other things in databases, right? Because they they have a similar effect. So if you, if you query something, right? So you, you, you do something over the data model and it gives you something back in the database engine and then ranks something, I right? say, so page rank. That has an effect especially if you're while entering data, right? That doesn't affect how you treat your database in the very same way as the configuration of the static data model. And there's, for example, one effect, right? So if you have a, if you have a power law distribution of how frequent uh, certain, or how much information there is in a certain thing, um, once you use this kind of page rank process, your power and your power level gets steeper and steeper, right? Which is a big problem, right? Is concentrated on Melissa ever more. Right? And I think that's something which is as relevant. And uh, that's something we, that's, I think it, it would be a good example in this discussion of, of education. Right? There is a certain, um, there are certain fields which we can cover, right? Because we're, we're specialists on, say, what, on data models, on particular languages, and whatever. But there's these other things out there where we have thousands of engineers in Google working on it every day, right? which have as strong as an effect. And the question is, how can we people prepare for that gap? Because if they go somewhere, say, they, if they're trying to come to the new websites with XML, um, they will be confronted with that. 
that basically um, the influence of that patriot mechanism, for example, is way stronger on how people browse their website than their data. Yeah, I, I wanted to react quickly on two aspects while you're The thread between Fotis and Elena concerning the research question. Sometimes you can't, and because, like you said, we've got students. But you need to keep this in mind in a way, and that reacts, that's also an answer to your question. How do you teach to archive it, archive this in library? Because I did this seminar in, in Stefan's uh, institute uh, last year, uh, where we included a, a diary from a woman in the 1940, 1941, and um, was quite a successful seminar at the end of the day. But we started by saying, look, you're putting yourself in the, in the skin of someone responsible for putting together digital edition in a library, and you need to identify your target. Let's imagine it's useful for the story. Do the edition and model your data in such a way that you know the limit, what you can do, and what the historian will do after. The typical case is modeling persons. So I, mean, I saw once an entry of blah, 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 some, some objective info, like you would have in the, in the National Library database, and then Nazi. Say, hey, why did you write that? Well, because it's said in the document. Yeah, but that's this woman saying that this sort of person is a Nazi. The historian has to decide. It's not your job to put those kind of features. You let the others. The other point is that concerning End of the story. The other one is concerning getting your hands dirty. Um, and I spoke about confidence you need to give to the students. One of the messages I gave this time was to people in, in uh, literature, literature. literature. So no, no technical background at all. And I said the objective of the course is at the end, we can go to a computer sciences and say, I want this, this, this. I don't want to bother it, but that's the kind of data I want as input, as output, and that's it. And we should be looking for it. So you need to know enough of the technology to give orders, because you've got the science. The computer scientist is done. <laughs> you will never be able to continue in your, your field, basically. And this, is, this is an important aspect. Well, that's very interesting. But one of the things that your comment reminds me is that the digital humanities <coughs> community does data modeling on at least two levels. There are some of us whose job is to model data on behalf of others, right? We're the effective consultants. And there are others of us who are modeling on behalf of ourselves. Of our research. Yeah, yeah, yeah our own research, exactly. We are the scholars, we are in charge of our project. Or both. Or, 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 or both. Sure, absolutely. But the point is that there are these two different ways mm -hmm. in which data modeling functions in digital humanities. And I wonder whether the teaching exercise is inflected by that. Because I'm, mm -hmm. I'm aware, of, I teach electronic publishing, which is secretly data model uh, at the London School at Illinois. And what I have my students do is pretend to have a project. Right? So they have to follow the modeling exercise through schema development, data <coughs> samples, document analysis, right. um, designing a publication, and so forth. And I ask them to use a project of their own, right? to, to come up with some project that they care about, because um, as has already been observed, it gives them a greater sense of investment outcome. But I've often thought that I would really like to be able to teach them how to take any anybody's data and think interestingly in a kind of vicarious way. <laughs> you see what I mean? In other words, teach people to kind of project their um, their imagination into somebody else's data and try to understand what the what those other motives might be. And I don't know uh, you know how one might go about teaching that or whether it's just the same set of skills. I would say you need to have some experience in the first to progressively get the pleasure in looking at someone else's data. Um, step by step is something which is... Um, or maybe it's just about... <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to say that I teach a, a course and have for a long time, somewhat like Laurent, and, and also in answer to, to your question, Fotis, um, and, and, and also in answer to you, Julia, it seems to me that um, what happens is, and I, again, I'm teaching students from a wide variety. I taught this in the library school and, and now in digital humanities, that in a way they, they get sucked into the content. Um, so I, I don't tend to, sorry for all the medievalists here, you know, pick something medieval. I do pick fairly contemporary. A, it's what I'm interested in, but B, it's something that they can relate to. 
and I have a class going on right now, and they're becoming, they're totally sucked in to the content areas and doing research that, I mean, I wouldn't have even thought to ask them to do. So, but, but they're coming up now with the research questions because now they're so engaged with the content that, that they're moving forward without me. Um, so I, I find that that way works for it very well. I just wanted to go back to maybe a couple things that, that were said in, in terms of how do you kind of abstract maybe in, in a way um, um, that's, that, that's different. Um, and, and I was again thinking of one of Willard's um, uh, uh, models of say something like representation. And so if, if you teach something called representation, I mean Trevor was talking about representation in his whole talk. That's one way of representing. You were talking about representing literature you, through visualization tools. Jonathan Stray has a fabulous article about representing the Iraq war, log, uh, war logs um, and the inherent issues with the algorithms that were used to create the representation and how that inflects or influences our way of reading it. And so I'm wondering if there are ways to you know, again, kind of go up one level and say, okay, we're going to do representation, or maybe not even say that, and, and teach about all the ways we use data in ways of representing our information in the world we live in, but then finding some ways for them to begin to move to the next step of kind of modeling that themselves and realizing how their model affects the ultimate representations at the, at the final point of whatever visual visuals they're looking at, or, or even within the encoding themselves, itself, if you're thinking of something like XML. back to what you said. So once you want a computational model, <coughs> you have to know the, the foundations of computational modeling. Uh, and that's why you need this type of information as well. So it all hangs together. So you have to do everything. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. That's always a good solution. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the, uh, I, mean, I feel like I'm
conceptual way of teaching that one could do. Not, not, not relational databases, but relational calculi is a, is a sort of like a kind of safer way, a safer place for us to be professional. You know, and if we, it's, a, it's, a, it's not, we're not totally free here in a way, because it can be very hard to get a course on XML into the curriculum. Uh, it can be very hard to get a course on XML, you know, into, into a, you know, just, uh, you know, get that course approved. Start talking about foundation of information theory, and <laughs> suddenly we're, and I think I'm one of the panelists, and forgive me, I just get a little bit too upset at it. Uh, uh, I'm usually, you know, I teach this course, but it's secretly this, so I mean, you know, <laughs> you know we're doing this all the time. And sometimes we're trying to slip in the, you know, slip the theoretical into the practical, and sometimes we're trying to slip the practical into the theoretical. But either way, these are not, the, the playing field is not exactly even here, what we're talking about. Also, Julius Dean is out. What's that? <laughs> Julius Dean is out. Okay, well. <laughs> There's maybe an implicit argument for saying, taking up the distinction by Alka that um, we have data modeling and then there's a subgroup of computa computational data modeling. And what you are talking about is lying, lying about the foundations of your computational data modeling, and that would be the foundation for all data modeling. And that was the way I was trying to deal with that. Well, just reiterate, you know, um, I don't see myself as, 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 special, as particularly foundations for computational data modeling. But if you want to simply understand a domain, regardless of your digital um, plans for managing data in that domain, then I think um, you know, logic and formal languages and, and relations like are, are all relevant to simply understanding the domain from a modeling point of view. 
this too, because I think Steve is absolutely right about a lot of departments. I would say that's definitely true for, um, for example, the English department where I teach, but I also teach in an I school. And I would say it's actually, my experience is it's sort of the inverse, that, that, um, that it's much easier to get a course to fly, especially at the core level, if it's something like a basic technology course, a, pro a basic programming course, um, uh, and so forth, or cataloging. Um, I, I once taught classification theory, which was a survey of classificatory principles across the different disciplines, so biology, philosophy, linguistics, and the challenges from fields like cognitive science. And it was a blast, but I've only been able to teach it once. And because it's, I think this maybe applies to a lot of professional schools, that if you're teaching in a professional school, then very hands-on education is, um, is what counts. Well, and that's especially interesting given the set of decisions that are being made now about whether graduate programs in digital humanities are construed as professional schools. Yeah, absolutely. So, for example, when people ask me where are the graduate programs in digital humanities, and I do my sort of annual look through, I'm always astonished by how many of them are specifically aimed at at least marketing themselves as providing practical training for people who are going to be working in areas like media, mm -hmm. as opposed to people who are going to be teaching humanities subjects. Um, and I think there, that at least this is in the United States, and I'd be really interested in how the landscape might be different in Germany and elsewhere in Europe. Yeah. Um, we, we think about graduate programs. What about undergraduate programs? We don't teach an undergraduate program, but we teach some modules that people can plug in within their own program major and whatever. Um, there is a big debate we are having within King's whether or not institute an undergraduate program in digital humanities. And my hypothesis has always been to do a minor, at a, uh, connect as more or less as you do guys um, in Würzburg. So to have you know someone take a major in English or in um, French and they do a minor in digital humanities, which is a methodological approach to there. But my new director, Andrew Prescott, um, as a completely different idea. His idea is that the discipline does not exist if it doesn't have a major, a single honor in, in, in the undergraduate level. So if we cannot provide a single honor in, in digital humanities, digital humanities is not a discipline. So there is a debate, a large debate that we would like to start now. Uh, we, we just started a debate at King's, but we hope to use the Digital um, Humanities Conference uh, in Hamburg and the panel that we are both in on, on teaching digital humanities to start this debate to say, what would you fit within a digital humanities single honor for undergraduate level? Which kind of person, which kind of professional or non-professional profile are you trying to create? Someone that goes out there and is able to do a website, or someone that goes out there and is able to be a librarian, or does research after what uh, uh, someone that has a, you know, graduated in digital humanities will do. I come from an experience from, from Italy, from Pisa, which there is a very healthy uh, digital undergraduate digital humanities, which is a more the first I said that the former uh, approach, so create some professional, someone that is able to do a localization of software, for instance, a technical writer of software, or web designer, or something like that. And this is what digital humanity has been, and it works very well. People get a job, they're very happy, there are lots of people, etc. But my, my question is, is that the only approach? Is that the professionalizing, creating the professional uh, humanities person, someone that has a lot of humanities background, but also the technique to, to do something with that, is what we want to create. Or we want to create a small researcher. So uh, everybody is a researcher, because we do think more or less of that respect, of what we do. What we do is more or less research. So I was wondering if this is the only thing. That's my question. I, I, I think that's really interesting, and I'm glad that you're posing a question that way, generally, in conference and homework. I think that would be really good. And one of the things that I'd like to see asked in that context is, what do we mean by asking this question? When we ask this question, do we imply that, for example, an English major or a history major is bound for a particular professional track? Um, when we ask this question, do we assume that, no, that, that a discipline, a new discipline, needs to create a space in the economic marketplace for itself before it can be recognized? That because the economy is already divvied up among the 
the matrix that already exists, and therefore there is no call for a new discipline unless there is a new profession for it, right? Um, and, and, and similarly, um, I think that um, the, the question has to do with the way in which we conceive the humanities as a whole, because as we know, there's been a crisis going on for years at the graduate level about whether all English graduate PhDs are going to be professors. I mean, is that a real assumption that we're actually making, or is this something that we're presuming as a kind of, you know, something in order to legitimize our activities without actually being able to deliver on it, right? So the, the, those questions are bound up in a lot of really, really interesting and important questions about what the academic programs are all about. Yeah. I think that's a very interesting point. I just wanted to uh, 
tell you something about an example, and I, I got an email a few days ago. Uh, one of these students who actually went through this project, she wrote back to me and she said, okay, I've got a job in a big German firm, which is not nothing to do with digital humanities or humanities or anything like that, but uh, as she knows how to write, uh, com uh, wait a minute, she knows how to write a, a text by using the computer in a professional way, and she has learned XML. XML. Uh, she has um, she got this job, and she is completely happy about it. So I mean, even just humanities can lead to a good um, professional start in life. I think <laughs> we are all very helpful. <laughs> we hope yes, that. By, yeah, because people have got something else. They bring a lot of other things with them and they get trained on in the firm in the end more and more specific specific and they're trainable. Somebody you are the oh, yeah. generation you are that person. Well, I was just sitting with three people who can read better than I can. Awesome. <laughs> I I think it is time for a break. Yeah. So uh, thank you. I, I have an announcement before the break, can I? Um, I'm putting a new hat that is the one of the TI board at the moment. I'm very glad to announce that to save the date, the next TI members meeting. <gasps> <laughs> I know, I know you can't wait for that. It will be uh, held in um, at Texas A&M University from the 7th to 11th of November. A formal announcement will be uh, followed tonight on the TI list. And we can um, congratulate uh, the future chair of the scientific committee for this conference. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, I've never done it, so I hope I will do a, a, good, a good job. So um, uh, just forgive me. But that's it. I'm, I'm bound to announce uh, publicly. For the, you are the first in the world to know that. Uh, <laughs> that's 7, 11 November at Texas AM. Um, uh, the host will be Laura Mandel. Of course, uh, and uh, there will be the TI members meeting this year. Thank you. Thank you.